Thank you everyone for coming tonight. My name is uh, John Heinz. I'm the class of 2009 and law school class of 2014, and I will be introducing our guests this evening. Uh, before we get started, I just want to thank uh, Jones Day for offering us this beautiful space, uh, especially all the staff who have stayed late to accommodate us. In particular, I'd like to thank uh, Dana Clabbers, who has uh, done a lot of work pulling uh, various pieces together, correcting uh, my many missteps along the way. So uh, Dana, the Alumni Club is, is grateful for all your hard work. Uh, yeah. I'd also uh, like to thank uh, Leah Hopke and the leadership of the Notre Dame Club of Washington, D.C. for embracing this event and for all of their hard work organizing as well. There are ex some exciting alumni events coming up. On March 25th, uh, there will be a screening of the Father Hesburgh documentary, God Country, Notre Dame, at the E Street Cinema. And on May 24th is Universal Notre Dame Night, and the uh, D.C. Alumni Club will be hosting uh, Father Monk Malloy, past president of the university. Uh, this is a good time to plug dues-paying members of alumni clubs. Um, the DC club in particular does a lot of great events like these, uh, supports local students with scholarships, and uh, so if you're someone who's, you know, your membership has maybe lapsed or you're on the fence about, you know, wanting to, uh, to become an official dues-paying member, we really encourage you uh, to participate. It's a, it's a great way to get involved and support all the great things that the club does. Um, one final housekeeping item, um, the, uh, the bar will be closed during the event. As I said, it will reopen for about a half an hour after the program is over. And then um, we, but we do need to be out of this room by 8.30 p.m. There's breakdown for an event that will be taking place in the morning. So uh, please, you know, try to, to keep to that 8.30. Okay, now where are my guests? Okay. You guys can come on up. Um, our uh, moderator this evening is Megan Wold. Megan is an Ohio native and a graduate of Ohio Wesleyan University and the Notre Dame Law School, where she graduated summa cum laude. Uh, after law school, Megan served as a Karis Fellow with the Ohio Attorney General's Office, and then as a law clerk to Judge Jeffrey Sutton, the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, and Justice Samuel Alito of the United States Supreme Court. Despite her strong Ohio roots and Notre Dame ties, Megan somehow did not end up at Jones Day. She, <laughs> she is currently a partner uh, in the appellate litigation group at Kirkland and Ellis. Megan, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Our special guest this evening is Judge Amy Barrett. Judge Barrett is a native of New Orleans, Louisiana, a graduate of Rhodes College and, of course, Notre Dame Law School, where she received the William J. Hoynes Prize for finishing first in her class. Judge Barrett is no stranger to Washington, D.C. After graduating law school, she served as a law clerk to Judge Lawrence Silberman, United States Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, and the late Justice Antonin Scalia, the United States Supreme Court. She stayed in Washington for a short while after her clerkships, first in private practice, and then as a fellow at the George Washington University Law School. In 2002, Judge Barrett returned to Notre Dame as a full-time member of the law school faculty, in 2014, she was honored with the Diane and M. O. Miller Research Chair of Law, and she was named Professor of the Year in 2010 and 2016. For any aspiring law professors out there, don't ever let anyone tell you that you can't show clips of my cousin Vinny during your evidence lectures and still be an award-winning professor. <laughs> in May 2017, the President nominated Judge Barrett to serve on the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. She was confirmed by the Senate and received her commission on November 2nd, 2017. Judge Barrett's chambers are in South Bend, where she and her husband, Jesse, live with their seven children. So please join me in welcoming uh, Judge Barrett and Megan Wold. Judge Barrett, as I think that introduction amply demonstrates, you are without a doubt among the most gifted lawyers of your generation. And when I talk to someone like you, I'm always curious when and how that person came to know what lawyers are and what they do. For me, I have a distinct memory of watching The Rainmaker with my dad on vacation <laughs> when I was in grade school, which is probably not the best introduction as to an accurate depiction of our profession, but it was my introduction. What is your earliest memory of knowing or thinking that you know what it is that lawyers do did you grow up in a family of lawyers or did you encounter it someplace else? Well, my dad is a lawyer. Um, my mom, before, before my mom had me, she was a high school French teacher. 
And in my mind, I thought the two coolest things to be would be a high school French teacher or English teacher or a lawyer. But I was heavily leaning towards high school teacher, not law, um, until later in the game. But it was my dad um, who kind of showed me what it was to be a lawyer. That's great. Now, you grew up in New Orleans. Um, my passing familiarity with New Orleans and my subscription to Garden and Gun magazine tells me that uh, when someone in New Orleans asks, where did you go to school? They mean, where did you go to high school? So in the New Orleans sense, where did you go to school? Um, that is very true. New Orleans, um, one of the things that I love about New Orleans is that people tend to stay there for generations. So my great-great-grandparents had come to New Orleans from France, and then families stayed for generations thereafter. So I went to high school at um, St. Mary's Dominican High School, um, which is where my grandmother and my mother and all of my aunts and my sisters and my nieces, it's an all-girls school, my nieces who um, are being raised in New Orleans, I'm sure will go one day too. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, what were those years like for you in, during high school? You know, I loved uh, the high school that I attended. I loved being at an all-girls school. Um, it was really, I think, freeing. I mean, you know, we just, I, I formed really close friendships. We could be very competitive with one another academically. There was just, just a lot of freedom. I was actually recently back at my high school last summer for an event for an alumni event, um, and I was sad. I mean, my, my kids are in a great situation in South Bend, and we love it, but I was sad, actually, that my daughters couldn't attend um, the high school that I attended because I did have such great, great memories and great experiences there, some of my closest friends. Yeah. Was there a particular person, any mentor that had a special impact on you during those years? Um, you know, there were several teachers who took a special interest in me in high school, and when I was back, last summer, I saw several of them. I think that um, when a teacher pays special attention and singles a student out, um, just pursues the student and builds a relationship, I think it can have a big impact on the student's life. And I saw several of these teachers. Some of them were nuns. Um, some of them were not. Uh, many of them are still in the faculty of the school, and it was great to see them. So I would say there were three or four who really took a very special interest in me and kept up with me over the years. Wonderful. After attending St. Mary's Dominican High School, you went on to study at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. To those of us who are less acquainted with the South, Memphis and New Orleans might seem awfully similar, that they're both mm -hmm. southern cities with cultures that are centered on food and music. Um, was that change in geography significant to you as a native, uh, native of New Orleans? I would say that New Orleans and Memphis have some similarities, but they definitely have very distinct personalities, too. Um, Memphis was attractive to me. I'm the oldest of seven children, um, and you know my parents had a lot of private school tuitions that they were paying around the time that I went off to college, and I also didn't want to go too far away because my family was very close-knit. Um, both my immediate family and extended family, and so I got a really good scholarship to Rhodes, and it was driving distance. It was six hours. And it was a city you know, in which I felt comfortable. And it was a liberal arts school. Um, I was never destined for the uh, sciences or math. So <laughs> liberal arts was uh, the perfect fit for me. <laughs> I, I share that sentiment about science <laughs> and math. <laughs> and you studied English at Rhodes. Why yeah. was that? You know, I loved, ever since I was a little girl, I've loved to read and write. And you know, being an English major um, allowed me to do that. I minored in French. Um, in part because of that high school French teacher and mom, um, you know, that I had, but it was, it was interesting. I got my, I got an A minus in French and I was pretty upset about that. I, I didn't want that A minus in French. So I decided to minor in it to try to conquer it. Um, and when my, one of my French professors wrote me a recommendation for a study abroad program, he wrote, um, speaks French with strong southeastern Louisiana accent. <laughs> so I don't know that it was ever, I mean, I managed to become somewhat fluent, but I don't think I would have ever passed for a native. So um, I majored in English and minored in French. And did you have any mentors while you were at Rhodes? And if so, what were the particular qualities of that mentor that made the relationship significant to you? I had a number of faculty in the English department that I grew close to, and there was, um, one woman in particular, Jennifer Brady, uh, she taught, I took every class that she taught. I loved her. Um, 
And what was significant about her in my life is when I was a freshman, I took a class that she taught on the novel of manners. And I had to give a presentation on breakfast at Tiffany's. And it was primarily a uh, junior and senior class. So I was one of the, the you know, newest, youngest students. I think I was a first semester freshman. I was very intimidated. I did this presentation. And I you know, was sure that it had gone awfully. But she sought me out afterwards. And she liked what I had done. And she encouraged me. And I think that's what mentoring is. I think taking the time to reach out to someone, to talk to someone. She encouraged me, became a mentor. And then at graduation, she gave me um, the collected works of Truman Capote because she remembered from the first class kind of what the connection between us had been. The sort of pivot point of a young person's life as you were graduating from Rhodes and, and moving on, you decided to pursue a law degree. But you mentioned earlier that your first inclination had been more toward English or teaching. So what, what made the difference? What changed? When I was a senior, I can distinctly remember being in my dorm room thinking about it. You know, I, I took both the GRE and the LSAT, and I was thinking of going on. Um, I had decided not. I wasn't pursuing high school teaching at that point. I was thinking that I would pursue a PhD in English and maybe be a professor, university professor in an English department. And I also thought about law school. Um, I went back and forth and made pro-con lists and thought about it, and ultimately I liked that law uh, would equip me more to make, um, and I feel terrible at saying this because I just finished saying how my English professor had such a big impact on my life, but I, I liked the way that law um, would enable me to do the reading and writing that I loved, but also be kind of involved in um, real world things, in, in real world policy and, and shaping of society in a more direct way um, than I thought teaching English literature would. And then you made a decision that everyone in this room can relate to. You decided to go to Notre Dame. <laughs> so what brought you to South Bend, Indiana? Why Notre Dame? So um, I, I'm a Catholic, and I always grew up loving Notre Dame, you know, what Catholic doesn't. Mm -hmm. And when I decided to go to law school, um, I really wanted to choose a place where I felt like I was not going to be just educated as a lawyer, but I wanted to be in a place where I felt like I would be um, developed and inspired as a whole person. And I think, what better place than Notre Dame for that? So I mean, I, I, I feel like I got an excellent legal education, um, but I also feel like I learned. You know, I think that, that Notre Dame likes to say that we educate a different kind of lawyer, and I think that the law school really tries to do that, and that was my experience there, that it was more about just learning a profession and also about learning to be a good person. And you came to Notre Dame just in time to see the decline of the Lou Holtz years. Did you, go to many, <laughs> did you go to many football games? Were you a fan? I did. I went to all the football games, um, standing in the, the student section. I prefer sitting now. But you know, I did. I did. I, and you know, that's such a fun part of the Notre Dame experience, and knowing all the cheers and, and all that. And during your time on campus, were there um, any particular innovations or things you remember? I think. For a lot of us, we have this experience of going back and there's always something new, a new law school, the hockey arena, the Eddy Street Commons, this type of thing. Was, uh, was that something that you remember from your time there? No. I think, you know, if there, there were probably some dorms that were going up around. I graduated from law school in 1997, but I've been back as a faculty member since 2002 and the real explosion of buildings has been more recent. I mean, when I, when I started law school, there wasn't even a Starbucks in South Bend. Wow. Um, so <laughs> it's what a much more drink? attractive place to live now. <laughs> <laughs> and as you mentioned, you had been a student at Notre Dame and now had returned as a professor later in life. Are there any differences that you observed during that time? At Notre Dame? At Notre changes Dame. Changes then and now? Yeah. Um, well, certainly our facilities are much nicer. <laughs> so the law school, for those of you who haven't seen it back at campus, um, the law school has a beautiful, beautiful new building, which is now one of the nicest law schools really in the country. Um, so the facilities are certainly um, much improved from the time when I was a student, but we've retained the older building that has a lot of the traditional architecture. So the um, renovation of that building is beautiful as well. I think that there are changes um, in the faculty uh, that are different. When I, when I was a student, I couldn't say what the percentage of male and female students are, but 
male students definitely outstripped female students. I mean, the percentages were not even. And on the faculty, there were not many women. I can think of one, I can think of two women, um, one who taught contracts and one who was a legal writing instructor. But otherwise, my professors were all male. Um, so occasionally, we had a visiting professor come in. And I would say that when I was a student, um, I thought that the class was a little bit tough on some of the female visitors that we had in. And I was nervous when I came back and joined the faculty. As a woman, I was probably about 30. And so some of my students were close in age to me. So I wore my glasses when I taught to try to look <laughs> very imposing. Um, and more women ha had joined the faculty since then by the time I was there. And, and now that's even more true. You know, Now we have a number of really, really great and prominent women on the faculty. And I think that the faculty and the, the balance and the presence of women both in the student body and on the faculty has really changed quite a bit. Now, not having had many female professors during law school, you probably didn't have an example of exactly how to do that in the classroom. You mentioned a couple of things. But now, with experience under your belt as a professor, what is your philosophy of teaching, or how, how do you approach your time in the classroom? I really like teaching. Um, I loved it when I started, and I'm very happy that Notre Dame has let me stick around. I still teach a seminar a semester, and I've gotten to keep my office in the building. Um, I think that teaching is a give and take. I try, and many of my former students are here tonight, so you know, hopefully, hopefully you agree that I did this OK. I try not to ever say what I think. You know, I, I like to let students draw their own conclusions. So I think it's important to give students a mastery of the material. I don't want to hide the ball on what the substance is of the law of the classes that you know, I'm teaching. So I try to be very clear about the substance. And then when we talk about the deeper questions, I think it's really important for a professor to leave students free to draw their own conclusions and to not try to just shove their worldview or shove what they think, and so that there's much more of a give and take. And that's what I've tried to do in my classes, really, from the outset. And after law school, you went on to clerk for two significant jurists, Judge Silberman and Justice Scalia. I think of both of them as being known as particularly expressive people. When it came to writing in particular, how were they different in terms of their style or their approach? Oh, in some ways, I think Judge Silberman was a little bit more casual, in a, in, if, if I could say it that way, um, than Justice Scalia. But they both were just excellent writers, so I learned a lot from both of them. Um, Judge Silberman wasn't as distasteful of legislative history as Justice Scalia was, <laughs> so they had some differences in that regard. Um, but I was very fortunate to have the chance to learn from two men who were great lawyers, great writers, great judges. And now, as a judge yourself, you have uh, the opportunity to hire your own clerks. And I suppose for those non-lawyers in the room, the relationship between clerks and judges is very particularized to the profession. It's sort of a, a mentoring relationship and probably unusual among professions that you see individuals so soon from coming from their education, people fresh out of law school, working for people who are at the peak of their profession, working directly and in close quarters. As you look for clerks or have the experience of hiring them now, what do, you, what do you think are great qualities to look for in a clerk or important ingredients of the clerkship experience? So for those of you who aren't lawyers in the room, usually a judge will have um, four clerks as the number that I have. And so you work very closely with your clerks throughout the day. And it's a one year, um, it's, kind of a, it's, it's, it's almost like a postdoc. It's a one year experience for the law clerks. And obviously, for the, for the judge, and the volume of work on the Court of Appeals is high. Um, and so obviously, for a judge, having lawyers, young lawyers who are really smart and really good writers is very, very helpful to my work. And you know, I, I once heard a judge say, before I was on the bench myself, that the difference between having a really good law clerk and just an OK law clerk can be translated into hours a day that you have with your children. And I have seven of them. So I need hours with my children. So having clerks that can stay, you know, um, stay on top of things and help me be ready for hearing argument and to, to spot issues and to turn research around quickly 
is really important. So it goes without saying that having um, law clerks who are very able is important. But you know, as I said about when I chose Notre Dame, I chose Notre Dame because I wanted to not just be educated um, with excellence, but I also wanted to be around people who could um, inspire me to be a better person. And so I hope that that is the experience that my law clerks will have. I mean, I, I like in chambers, I want my law clerks to like each other. I want them to not just come and feel like it's a professional experience only, but to come and feel like they're in a place where they like to be, um, where the dynamic is good between, um, between the law clerks and one another, and then the law clerks who have gone before them and who will come after them, um, so that they have a network of, of people who are you know, trying to, to do good and, and be good. Um, and be excellent. That's great. Uh, Justice Scalia specifically was known for his wit and his humor. Uh, it seems to be a, a mark of many great souled men and women that their intellectual rigor is matched by their capacity for humor and laughter. What were some things in your experience that made Justice Scalia laugh? <laughs> <laughs> um, so he laughed a lot. He did have a great sense of humor. Um, once. So Justice Scalia famously really liked to hunt. And the justices divide up the country by circuits, and each justice is in charge of a particular circuit. And Justice Scalia was responsible for the Fifth Circuit, which includes Louisiana, my home state, sportsman's paradise, as the uh, <laughs> saying goes, um, and also Texas and Mississippi, all, all places where there was hunting to be had. So he went on a hunting trip one time, and he came back, and he was very proud of a picture of him in camo with a gun holding a wild turkey that he had killed you know, by the feet. And he showed us this picture. And one of my co-clerks took the picture and had it made into a mouse pad. <laughs> <laughs> and we each got one, so I still have my mouse pad. <laughs> but slipped it onto the justice's desk and then just waited. And we had the office that was right outside of the justices um, at that point. And he was really nervous because he wasn't sure if this was going to go over well or whether the justice was going to be upset that he stole the picture and had it made into a mouse pad. <laughs> but the justice just hadn't gone to his computer yet when he saw it. And he had his big bellowing laugh <laughs> come out of chambers. And he, he thought it was very funny. So that's a, a fun moment, memory that I have from that year. <laughs> and uh, many of us in the room might be familiar with Justice Scalia's jurisprudence, um, certainly with his reputation, but you, you knew him personally. Is there anything that you learned from Justice Scalia or that you remember about him that is a, an everyday insight that you continue to think about today? He was very rigorous. Um, there was nothing really more intimidating, I think, um, that I've experienced you know, before or since than being in the room, getting him ready for oral argument, and just having to be ready to answer questions about a case. So he, was, he didn't slack up. Um, he was always very rigorous in his preparation. And he always was who he was. I mean, he was a man of faith. He was a family man. He had a large family. And you know, he, was, he took a lot of criticism from many quarters for the values that he had and the choices that he made, um, and you know his Catholicism and his faith, and you know he just he had the strength to be who he was. How and when did you meet your husband, Jesse? Um, I met Jesse when we were in law school. He's a double domer, so we met in law school at Notre Dame, and he had also got, gone to Notre Dame undergrad, um, and then we got married in 1999. Wonderful. And you mentioned that you have seven children. Can you tell me about them? We do. So um, it's funny when we got Jesse is an only child. And wow. <laughs> I always wanted a big family. I loved, you know, growing up. I'm the oldest of um, 29 grandchildren as as well. Um, the seven children in my family. So I loved having a big family, and I wanted to have a big family. And he did too, um, because he felt very lonely as an only child. So he really wanted a, a big family too. We started out actually saying seven, but then with each child we had and we realized how much work it was, we started kind of scaling back, but then we bumped it back up. So we have, um, we have seven. Our oldest, Emma, is a senior in high school, so um, she's gotten into Notre Dame, so you know we'll see uh, <laughs> what she decides. Um, then we have Tess and Vivian are both freshmen in high school, and then our son, John Peter, is in fifth grade, Liam's in fourth grade, Juliet is in second grade, and Benjamin is in first grade. So it's a full house. <laughs> I should say so. 
And two of your children you adopted from Haiti. Why did you and Jesse decide to adopt? Um, when Jesse and I, we got married when we were living in DC. We were actually living in Northern Virginia. And when we did our marriage preparation with the priest at the parish that we were attending at the time, he had us meet with another young couple in the parish as just part, they were a young married couple just as part of the um, pre-Cana prep. And this couple had adopted a special needs child. And it made a big impact on us. And then we also knew another couple who had adopted um, some children from Russia. And so when we were engaged, we talked about it and said, you know, I think that's something that we'd really like to do one day. And we had our daughter, Emma, and then we adopted Vivian. We, we knew that we wanted to adopt internationally. Um, the wait for domestic adoption was just very, very long. And there were so many children in need, and we researched, and Haiti um, is you know, one of the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere, and it's close enough to the United States that we could go as a family um, and be involved in Haiti as the children got older. So we chose Haiti. And Vivian um, came home to us when she was 14 months old. So we had Emma, and then um, we had our daughter Tess. Tess and Vivian are both freshmen in high school, and we call them our very fraternal twins. Um, <laughs> Vivian is amazing. She was 14 months old when she came home, and she couldn't make any sounds at that point, nor could she pull herself up to a standing position. And she was wearing size zero to three month clothing because she just was so malnourished. And at the time, they told us they just weren't sure um, whether she would speak. Um, she just hadn't been, she'd been so sick, she hadn't had a lot of practice making sounds, and she hadn't been spoken to a lot, although she was in a wonderful orphanage. The nannies there loved the children immensely. Um, but she also had, she was just weak, and she had rickets, so her legs were kind of bowed out. Um, Vivian is incredibly athletic now, um, and Trust me, the speech hasn't been a problem. <laughs> um, so she really, it's amazing. I was looking at her the other day. She works out at um, a CrossFit gym. And she's very proud. I mean, she's incredibly strong. She just walked in and started doing pull-ups. Um, it, it's, it's, quite, it's quite something. So she's very strong. And I was looking at her the other day at the gym and just thinking what a miracle it is, you know, how strong she's become. So. We have the three older girls, and then we had our son, Liam. And we wanted to adopt another from Haiti. So we were in the process of adopting our son, John Peter. And there were a number of paperwork snafus, and it looked like it wasn't going to happen. And then they told us it wasn't going to happen um, because of I don't, paperwork things had just gone south. And so mentally and emotionally, we had closed that door. Liam was about nine months old at that point, 10 months. I remember it was right around December, and I thought to myself, we should just cut that paperwork, just kind of pull it out and bring it to a close, because they've told us that it's not happening, so we might as well just not have that loose end hanging out there. But Christmas came, and we didn't do anything about it. And then in January, there was the devastating earthquake in Haiti. And the uh, adoption agency called us and said, any child who had an adoption in progress at the time that the earthquake happened, the State Department will lift some of the paperwork requirements that we're keeping in the country, so are you still willing to take him? So we said, of course. Um, they said, well, we're not, we're not sure that we'll be able to get him out. We'll see. Everything was very fluid at that point. So we actually um, had wanted more children after our son Liam was born, but for a variety of reasons, we weren't sure that would happen. And Jesse was on the phone with the adoption agency, working out the logistics to go pick up John Peter in Florida. I just wasn't really feeling that great. Turned out Juliet was going to be coming along that year. So we had an intense three-hour period where we had to decide where we going to go forward with going to get John Peter in Florida um, because we discovered that Juliet was going to be coming um, that year, too. Like we had really wanted five, but now <laughs> it was kind of like five and six. So I threw my coat on. We live very close to campus. I threw my coat on, and it was January. So you, those of you from South Bend or lived in South Bend know the weather. I walked up to the cemetery on campus, and I just sat down on one of the benches, and I just thought, OK, 
well, if life's really hard, at least it's short. <laughs> um, but I thought, like, what, what greater thing can you do than raise children? You know, just that's where you have your greatest impact on the world. So, you know, we, Jesse was in Florida within a few days bringing John Peter home. He was three. When they stepped out of the car, they flew from Orlando to Midway, and when they stepped out of the car in Chicago, poor John Peter, the look of shock on his face, <laughs> it's the snow and the cold. He was like, he looked at my husband and was like, where have you brought me? <laughs> Take me back now. Um, but it's great. And then Benjamin you know, came along after that, and it's, it's a very full life, but um, a very wonderful one. That's beautiful. And Jesse is also a lawyer, so what is it like to be married to another lawyer? And perhaps even more importantly, what is it like for your kids? <laughs> <laughs> um, we don't see it because it's just how we talk. I have had the experience of having friends come over and hear my children say things to each other and say like, oh, so that's how kids of lawyers talk. <laughs> like, you know, and, um, but I think that they think that Jesse is much cooler than I am, which he is in every way. <laughs> but my husband, he's now in private practice, but for many, many years he was a federal prosecutor. So his dinnertime stories of what he was doing at the office were much more entertaining for them than mine. <laughs> so he had, he, one of his last cases that he prosecuted was an arson case. And boy, my sons just thought, you know, figuring out the details of that and how daddy was putting <laughs> the bad guys away, they really enjoyed that. I think everyone from Sheryl Sandberg to my mother-in-law has a theory about how women can balance family life with their careers. What is your theory? How does the Barrett family manage with two successful parents who are both in demanding jobs, both in a demanding profession? I think I have an awesome husband, so I don't think that I really foresaw or that he did either what would be required and we weren't we were open to either one of us staying home you know at, at different points when things were intense with the children but I think what's really made it work is that it's very much a team effort you know and, and in fact right now just because I'm in a job that is still new to me and I'm still on a learning curve so Jesse's really doing much more of the heavy lifting right now I mean he's doing you know, he's doing most of the cooking and he's doing most of the kids' doctor's appointments and, and things like that during the day. Um, so we've, we've gone in cycles and right now this is kind of his cycle where he's doing a little bit more of the home stuff. Um, I think living in South Bend and being at Notre Dame for so many years was also really helpful. I mean, South Bend is a small city, so it's been easy. You know, I can leave chambers. I was in my daughter Juliet's classroom um, running centers the other day so I could zip over from Chambers, go into her classroom, run you know, the Valentine's Day Center, and then go back to Chambers, and it didn't take that much time. So I think the city that we've lived in, the support you know, of the community, I mean, Notre Dame, when um, Emma was little and I first joined the faculty, I kept a basket of toys in my office, and so I could bring Emma to work with me, and you know, she would play with the toys, and sometimes I had student meetings. Um, Different. I, I never was in this position, but some of my female colleagues were able to bring babies to faculty meetings. So I think you know having the flexibility of a flexible workplace and a husband that pitches in and um, a town of a manageable size and great. We had a great childcare situation. Um, we really did. My husband's aunt has watched our children since Emma was little. So for almost. Almost 16 years, we've had you know consistent childcare in the home, and that's been really what's made it possible. Wonderful. When you distill a person's life down into these um, accolades and milestones, a sort of list of things, it can often look from the outside like everything was destined or went perfectly according to plan. When you think back to your life up to this point, has the plan always seemed obvious to you? the way it might appear to us on the outside? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, no, I mean, I, I went to law school, but when Jesse and I got married and we were here, I loved practicing at the law firm. 
um, when I had Emma and I was at GW doing a fellowship thinking about going the academic route, I was very on the fence because I had had my first baby and I felt terribly guilty leaving her in childcare to go into work and I thought, should I stay home with her? So I had a lot of soul searching um, conversations with Jesse and we thought about would I stay home with her? Would I work? We ended up, I was offered and um, obviously accepted the job at Notre Dame and we moved to South Bend. But I felt a lot of anxiety about whether I was doing the best thing, you know, being away from Emma and then when Tess and Vivian came along who were next in line. Um, I didn't know, I didn't have a plan. Things kind of unfolded. Um, and we evaluated at every step whether things were working well for the family, um, for the job that I was in. I thought about should I cut back, should I be part-time, should I be full-time. And so we just constantly evaluated, but it was always working, um, and it worked well. The kids were very happy. I loved teaching. I loved being in, you know, I loved doing that. I was very happy. And the, the judge thing was really out of the blue. I mean, that wasn't something that I, I'm still surprised that I'm <laughs> not, you know, just 100% full-time faculty member. Now we see that women are matriculating in law schools in even greater numbers than men. And a lot has been written about the need to include women in greater numbers on litigation teams and firm leadership on the bench at the federal level and at the state level. How have you seen the legal profession change as women have been entering in these increasing numbers? I think the flexibility, I mean, you told me that you were in a six month maternity right. leave. That's yeah. great. Um, I think as women are more present in law schools, um, as more women go to law school, as more women are on faculties and are at law firms, then I think then the workplace bends to be more flexible as women seek those accommodations. And so I think, you know, being able to take your child to a faculty meeting when you need to, having toys in the office, having leave policies that make it possible to work or flex policies that make it possible to return to work. Um, I think all of those, I see so many more options for women now in that regard than I did when I was a young lawyer. And I think it's great. You've had a lot of student support, uh, particularly for your nomination to the bench. Uh, and there was, in particular, a lot of recognition of the role that you played on campus as a mentor. And as you've discussed here tonight, you had some very important mentors in your life what do you think makes for a good role model and what traits do um, young professionals and students need to see manifested in their role models? Oh, I hate to think of myself as like a role model, but I'll <laughs> think I'll describe myself as a mentor because as a professor and you know now as a boss, I think I have a responsibility. I've long had a responsibility as a teacher to be a mentor. I think that's about time spent. So that um, English professor that I had in college had an effect on my life because she took the time to talk to me um, after class and to encourage me and to meet with me. And I think that's what's important about being a mentor. And so that's what I've tried to do with students is to talk to them. Um, I still talk to students. Students will still call about career changes that they're making or sometimes personal um, decisions that they have to make. And so I hope that I lay the groundwork with students when I'm teaching them and the students that I continue to teach and the law clerks that I now have well enough so that they feel free to still view me as a mentor even after they're outside of my classroom or outside of my chambers. Because I think that's I think it's really time spent, and life is so busy, and you know, I have a full life trying to juggle work and, and the children and, and all of that. Life is so busy, so it is sometimes hard to take extra time, and I think time is the most precious thing, really, that we have that we can give to other people. And to finish up, I'd like to do a lightning round, so quick questions seeking quick answers, if we can. Okay. Uh, what is your favorite word? <laughs> Chocolate. Oh, <laughs> great choice. What's your least favorite word? Impactful. Mm -hmm. Agreed. <laughs> Do you consider yourself creative? Um, I play a creative person by using Pinterest. <laughs> <laughs> what is a lawyer's trick or crutch or habit that you detest? 
using the word like in oral argument. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is a sound or noise that you love? A baby crying. <laughs> What's a sound or noise that you hate? A baby crying. <laughs> <laughs> what is a profession other than your own that you would like to attempt? I wouldn't mind going back to the high school English teacher or French teacher. And what's a profession that you would not like to do? Anything medical. I'm very squeamish. <laughs> and uh, lastly, when it's all over, what do you want them to say about you? That she loved well. Ladies and gentlemen, Judge Amy Coney Barrett. <laughs>